So this is Research Methods, Unit 3, Part 2, on Methods for Within. So one of the most important uh, concepts that we have in Research Methods has to do with reliability and validity, because we're measuring things. And what reliability and validity deal with is how you can measure things incorrectly. So reliability is the concept that refers to how repeatable a measurement is. Imagine if I were to measure a the height of something and you know you'd hope that if I measured it like yesterday I'd find the same height as if I measured it today and that if I measure it tomorrow it'll be the same height as well and that's what reliability is how reliable is your measure and validity captures a slightly different phenomenon which is whether or not the thing that you're measuring is actually accurately measuring what you attempt or aim to measure. So, you know, a good example of lacking validity would be, imagine that I have a stick that I assume is a yard stick, and I measure the height of something with it. But it turns out that it's a meter stick. Okay, So the measurement that I come up with is going to be in meters, not in yards. And so in that sense, my results aren't valid. Okay, even though they might be reliable, if I use the same stick yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it's going to give me the same height. However, it's not going to be the correct height, so it's going to be an invalid measurement, even though it is reliable. So, just keep this in mind. Whenever you measure anything, there's always some error variance. Error that's in the dependent variable that's not associated with the independent variable. So, for instance, measuring people's height. When you get up in the morning, you tend to be about an inch or a half inch taller than at night because over the course of the day, your body begins to slouch, your bones between begin to sag a bit, or at least the space between your bones. And so that's an example of error variance. But, you know, and that's of course a small one. Uh, you know, some measurements have large error variance. So um, the key really is to find a measure with the least amount of error. The way I like to conceptualize this is to talk about the game of darts. Now, of course, imagine that you're at the end of a game and you're trying to hit the bullseye. What happens is that what you really want when you're throwing your darts is to have both high reliability and high validity, which is represented by the dartboard in the top left. There, you're aiming for bullseye and you're hitting bullseye for the most part. And that's really what you want to have. Now, going over to having low reliability and high validity, here you have a situation in which all of your darts are hitting somewhere around the bullseye, but they're not hitting bullseye, but it's not as if they're biased in a particular direction. If you took the average location of all of those measures, you'd find that the average would be somewhere near the bullseye, but instead it's spread out, and this is because you have low reliability. So the measurement changes depending on each time you try to measure it. Now going down to the bottom left, what we have is the situation where you have high reliability but low validity. In that case, you can see that you're really hitting a very tight circle on the board. However, it's not the bullseye that you're aiming for. So in that sense, what you're, you know, you're, you're just off by a certain amount even though you're getting the same answer each time. And then finally, when you have low reliability and low validity, you're hardly even hitting the board at all. So you're hitting the wall behind the board. And that's a good way of representing re reliability and validity. I'm not the only one to use graphs like this. If you do a search in Google for images, you'll find many such images. But this is a good way to think of the difference between reliability and validity. Um, so. I want you just to, uh, this is a very important graph, so keep this in mind. So example, if you measured my height, I'm about 5'9", um, but you find if you had high reliability and high validity, you'd find that if you measured me, you'd get pretty much the same response each time. So 5'9", 5'10", 5'9 and a half, it all depends on whether or not I'm wearing shoes. However, if you have low reliability and high validity, you're going to be measuring each time like five foot zero, five foot nine, 
six foot six. In this sense, you know, the average of all those is about what my true height is, but the measurements vary really widely. And so it's providing you with uh, estimates that just aren't reliable, even if they are valid. Now, when you have low validity, but high reliability, you're getting the same measure multiple times. It's very close to each other, at least. So 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, 5. However, I can promise you I'm not 3 foot tall. But that's the case where you have low validity and high reliability. And of course, when you have low reliability and low validity, your answers are all over the board. So 7 foot 5, 6 foot 6, 6 foot 11. None of those are even near my height. The average of them is not even plausible um, for most people. And uh, so that's a case of having low reli reliability and low reliability. Construct validity. So there are different flavors of reliability and validity. For validity, there's construct, face, content, and criterion validity, of which that can be divided into both predictive and concurrent. And for reliability, we have systematic error, test, retest reliability, and internal consistency. So we're going to go through each of these in turn. So for construct validity, what this deals with is the property of a measure to actually measure the construct that it's designed to measure. Now, that is a mouthful, but it's hard to define construct validity other than saying, is your empirical construct a good measure of your theoretical construct. That basically is a single statement of what construct validity is. Whether or not your measure is actually tapping into what your theoretical construct is. So, for instance, a ruler has a high construct validity for measuring height. Whereas, please rate the degree to which you like broccoli on a scale of negative 10 to 10 that has low construct validity for measuring height. Whereas a ruler may have low construct validity for measuring broccoli preferences, and a scale of broccoli preferences has a high construct validity for measuring broccoli preferences. So the idea here is, is your measure accurately tapping into your theoretical construct? A second kind of validity deals with face validity. And the idea here is that when you have a measure, it should, at least superficially, appear to test what it's designed to. So, for instance, you may think that last year's income has high face validity for measuring socioeconomic status. However, that's not true, a, a great measure. A better measure is educational attainment of parents which has low face validity for measuring social class, but it's better than yearly income for the nebulous concept of socioeconomic status. So face validity really is something which is important for people reading your study. You want to have constructs that seem to measure what they're supposed to measure. Now, face validity is not that important in an experimental sense. But when you try to communicate your findings, say, to your grandmother or, say, to another psychologist, it's useful to have measures that look like they're measuring what you set out to measure. And that's face validity. Content validity is the notion that a measure that you have should sample a range of behavior represented by the theoretical construct being tested. So given the fact that there's many ways of measuring a theoretical construct, some more narrow and some more broad, it's important to come up with a measure that captures the, the breadth of the theoretical construct that you're aiming to measure. So measuring the vocabulary size of six-year-olds by videotaping one week of natural conversation and counting the number of unique words spoken has high content validity because what you're going to get at the end of that is a a number which represents the natural language that the child speaks. However, measuring vocabulary size using a five-question test that asks if the child knows the words cat, dog, bird, mom, and bottle, that is low content validity because for 
honestly, most six-year-olds will know all of those words to begin with, and there are many words that are not being captured by that five-question test. So, in reality, what you want to have is a test that captures the full range of the theoretical construct being measured. Criterion validity is the idea that a test should correlate with other measures of the same theoretical construct. So imagine that I look at intelligence, and I measure that through the use of the SAT. And I can also look at GPA. Both of those measure academic aptitude. So what you would expect is that they would be correlated, or that there would be a similar score. If you score high on the SAT, that you probably are going to have high GPA. If you score low on the SAT, low GPA. And that's criterion validity, that multiple tests of the same theoretical construct should provide you with similar answers. Now, the two subcomponents are concurrent validity and predictive validity. Concurrent means, just like the example I used above, that two different tests should measure the same construct and should come up with the same result. It would be unusual to have students who score perfect on the SAT and yet have a GPA in the one-point range. And predictive validity has to do with something which is more useful, the idea of a measure of current performance to predict future performance. So if I measure a kid's IQ at age 6 and I measure it at age 12, you would hope that the results of the two tests would show similar findings. Or if you looked at someone's high school GPA and their college GPA, you would imagine that there's a relationship there, that people who did well in high school probably do well in college, people who did poorly in high school probably did poorly in college. Now, of course, there's always some people that a major life change occurs and they see the light and, you know, where they did poorly in, in high school, they did amazing in college. And, of course, there's those that really did well in high school, but they get involved in, say, drugs and drinking and partying in college, and so they do poorly. But for the most part, on average, you would expect that a measure of a theoretical construct at time one would be a good predictor of performance in a similar measure at time two, and that's predictive validity. Now, moving on to different kinds of reliability. The first one is systematic, okay, which can also be called bias. So this is a case where you have measurement that's associated with a consistent error. So imagine that I was to weigh people, and I took my scale that I bought in the United States over to France and I started measuring people and I reported their weight um, and I wrote it down and I published it in kilograms. Well, the problem there is that the scale that I bought in the United States probably measures weight in pounds so that everyone is going to get the wrong answer because the scale that we used is not the right scale for the French cultural context. So therefore, that would be an idea of systematic bias. Um, another set of examples would be if, on a scale of 1 to 10, if everyone always answers questions as a 10 without even reading the question, which is very common that people don't read questions on surveys, which is what we'll get to when we talk about surveys. And that's called acquiescence bias. Imagine that I ask you, how are you feeling? And everyone says, fine, 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 fine. Uh, then y you end up having you know, what's called an acquiescence bias, where everyone is just saying yes, yes, yes. Another bias is called central tendency bias. And this happens when you ask people on a scale of 1 to 10, they always answer 5. So do you, do you ask people, how happy are you on a scale of 1 to 10? They answer 5. How sad are you on a scale of 1 to 10? They answer 5. And just everything is answering the number 5. That would be called a central tendency bias. And that's a, one form of um, lack of reliability that's systemic. Test-retest reliability is the property of a test to provide the same score of repeated measurements, which this is kind of similar to a criterion validity, predictive validity, but it has to do with um, the error that will occur when you give someone a test and then retest them a short time later. So whereas predictive, of, uh, predictive criterion validity has to do with predicting things over the course of long spans of time. With test-retest, we're talking about 
whether or not the measurement of height should be the same on, say, a Tuesday and a Thursday, so a week away from each other, or taking the SAT multiple times, hoping that the test has low test retest reliability and that your initial score was the low one would be an example of test retest reliability. And then there's internal consistency, which refers to the extent that individual items measure a theoretical construct and correlate with each other. You would expect that the answers to the question, how happy are you in general, how happy were you yesterday, how happy are you today, and how happy are you right this second, that they would probably, that you would hope that people would give similar results. Now, not perfectly, not everyone's going to be answering seven for each of these, because maybe yesterday was a crappy day, or today is a crappy day, or today is wonderful, and yesterday was sort of, you know, meh, you know. S that would be an example of uh, internal consistency. And so what you're hoping for is for different measures of a theoretical construct all to correlate, because that would show that you have internal consistency in your scale. So I just want you in your head to have these examples and you know maybe this can provide you with some ideas for discussion. Um, imagine that you have a study comparing school achievement of high school students measured by their GPA by social economic status measured by parental income. So the average income of their neighborhood in which the child lives. Think about what are the theoretical and empirical constructs, what is the independent variable, what's the dependent variable, what are some threats to validity, and what are some threats to reliability. Second, imagine a study examining the relationship between violent television, measuring the number of hours of violent television children watched in a three-day period, versus number of fights between siblings per month, based on parental reports of witnessing fights. Again, what are the theoretical and empirical constructs? Independent variable, dependent variable, threats to reliability, and threats to validity. Finally, a study examining the relationship between attitudes towards drinking in college students, measured by a survey question, do you drink alcohol, versus likelihood of using marijuana, measured by a survey question, have you smoked marijuana in the past six months? Again, theoretical and empirical constructs, independent and dependent variable, and threats to validity and reliability. These are some things to think about, and they might help you in your thinking about how reliability and validity works.